Perfect. Thank you very much. So a short introduction uh, to this session. Welcome everybody. This is the third session in the series of uh, sessions regarding the call for comments for EID that TSEAS is holding. I'm Karin Bredenberg. I'm the co uh, one of the co-chairs of TSEAS. And with me, I have Kirsten Arnold, who is the EID team lead. And if nothing more than that, Kirsten, please lead this session and take us through this part of the EID revision. Okay. Thank you very much, Karin, for the introduction. Um, and apologies for everyone who already was at the last uh, session in May. Uh, we're going to do a brief introduction of the major revision process itself. So anyone who was uh, with us at the last session will already have seen this. Uh, but as we also have a few new people joining, uh, we thought it might be good to kind of bring everyone to the same page to start us off. So the major revision of ED started in 2021. And that first year we mainly used to get a better understanding of the status quo, which is mainly due to the fact that uh, we've essentially got two versions of EAD, uh, which are currently broadly used. Um, that's the latest version, EAD3, but also the previous version, EAD2002. Um, so we did uh, a few kind of um, presentations on EAD3 use cases. Uh, panel sessions and uh, workshops with um, different parts of the community to understand um, how they are using EAD um, and what they might want to see in a new version. 2022 was then the year where we mainly concentrated on aligning EAD with its main sibling standard for now, ECCPF. Um, ECCPF 2.0 was released in August 2022. Um, so a lot of things uh, suggested in the new version of EAD, EAD4, um, has been aligned with how things are used in ESCCPF. Um, and that also fell in line with TSES work on a third standard on functions. And then the last year, 2023, was the year where we specifically looked at uh, concepts that are only in EAD. Um, and that was kind of the final step in preparation for the first draft that we published in April this year. And we are currently in the big review phase um, with events like this one, but also kind of the general um, way to engage with the new version and provide feedback via GitHub and other ways, which I will detail in a second. There might be a second draft published towards the end of the year, depending on how much feedback we get and how much that changes um, the draft that we have published so far. Um, but the idea will be that um, the new version of ED will be, then be kind of submitted to SAA um, in the next year and hopefully published uh, in the next year towards the second half. So the call for comments as it stands for the time being, um, we have created two main pages where you can access all information related to the call for comments. Um, the first one is on the SAA website. So um, that is something that is more generally accessible for anyone who is online. Um, but we also have the same information in our GitHub repository um, so all the documents that we have released um, as part of this call for comments, and of course, the schema for the new version can be accessed here. And we will also be adding any kind of further documentation that we are creating at the moment to those two pages. So um, when you have those links, uh, you will have your stopping points for getting all information that you need. What do we currently have as part of the call for comments? Uh, there are different things. We've got a series on the descriptive notes blog, uh, which is run by SAA's description section. The third of five posts was just published last week. Uh, we have something that we've called editorial, which is a general introduction into EAD4 um, in terms of the new concepts that we have in there and uh, new ways of encoding. We have a more detailed overview in revision notes. So that's a direct comparison between ED3 and ED4. So what has changed? Of course, the ED4 draft schema. 
And then we have kind of different, um, more detailed overviews in a tabular format um, that provide you with information about how a specific element in EAD3 would need to be transformed in order to be EAD4 uh, compatible. Um, and uh, we also have created a few example files where we'll, where we'll be adding more um, in future. What we are currently working on and what we will be publishing by the end of this month is a draft tech library for ED4. Um, so to also make it easier for anyone who isn't that, let's say, technical to understand what is uh, in the new version, um, as well as revision notes and these transformation routes uh, in comparison to ED2002, because as I said earlier, we know that uh, a big part of the community is also still working with that version of EAD. Um, and at a later point, um, we will also provide a draft conversion from EAD3 to ED4. We are looking into the question of whether we provide a separate conversion from ED2002 directly to ED4, or if we are combining the already existing conversion between ED2002 and ED3 with that new conversion from ED3 to ED4, so kind of in a two-step part um, that will depend a little bit on the details and the options that we have in the current transformation between ED2002 and ED3, um, and whether we think it might make more sense to have a direct conversion. Um, and then we are also working on extensions to the best practices guide, which is something that was introduced with the publication of ESC CPF 2.0 uh, to also include examples for EAD4 specifically. These open drop-in sessions that we are currently running are meant to be uh, informal ways to engage with the community. So we will have a brief introduction to one major strand of the vision for each of those sessions. Um, and then essentially we are opening up the floor for any questions, comments, and suggestions that you might have. Uh, we also have prepared a few questions from our side where we just want to get a little bit more information uh, in terms of how you're using uh, specific elements or specific types of information, how you're encoding them. Um, so that will be the second part of today's session. And just for reference, the first session in April, which was uh, concentrating on how to contribute to the call for comments is already available on, on SAA's YouTube channel, the recording. Um, the second session uh, recording is currently in preparation, um, but the slide deck that session is available on those two pages that I mentioned earlier. Um, and today's session, we'll be talking about how ED is becoming more extensible in the new version. So that will be the topic for today. And then we will have one last of these open sessions on the 9th of July, uh, which is part of the pre-conference program for SAA's annual meeting. Uh, and I've included the registration link um, on this slide, and we will be sharing that slide deck also later on. Diving into the topic of today's session, extensibility, uh, I wanted to start with um, a few reasons uh, that we had to consider extensibility. Um, and this is essentially coming from the circumstance that the encoded archival standards have, let's say, a history of lending certain elements and attributes from other standards, which were incorporated into the schemas as they currently are. Um, and sometimes they were just kind of copied from those schemas uh, and other standards, but sometimes we also kind of gave them our own, um, let's say, definition and scope. So we had a slightly different way of doing things than the original contexts where we took those elements from. And that also meant that we had a certain necessity to keep pace with developments of those other standards. Um, so essentially kind of trying to make sure that if we had something that was more of a one-to-one -one adopt adoption, um, that we don't divert from anything uh, if the standard develops further. But also with the adopted elements to make sure that we still allow things 
that those general standards allowed in EAD if we wanted to. What we have now done is a slightly different approach, and we will go into those details um, in a little bit, but I just wanted to mention a few benefits that we saw in this approach. So essentially the current approach is a little bit more streamlined in terms of the elements used in various sections of an EES instance. So um, that is EAD at the moment, but um, in the long run also ECCPF and also the standards for functions. Um, and we think that this makes it a easier to learn those standards, but also make it makes it easier to use and manage them because you don't have to take care of that many variations. Um, it also reduces the complexity of specifically EAD by reducing the number of elements and attributes that are actually part of a standard. Um, and it also helps in maintaining the standard. So that was a very kind of, let's say, um, self-centered aspect of this extensibility as it also helps TSES itself, because we are now really focusing on the information that the EES are meant to encode rather than about how this information is displayed. With this, we are also building on general standards um, that are often used in export formats of collection management systems and that are supported by web browsers without necessarily having to take care of those standards ourselves. Um, and we're also enabling the inclusion of new attributes um, from those standards, but also from any other standard that you might be using in relation to EAD uh, without the requirement of having those added directly into our schemas. And with this, we are essentially kind of establishing a baseline where you can start very simple with just kind of text entries um, in your elements, uh, but add complexity step-by-step step depending on your description practices, but also on the needs or the functionalities that you want to support. So depending on what you have, you can kind of get more elaborate as you move along. One thing that I wanted to mention, because um, it is, of course, um, an additional kind of indirect requirement that comes with some of those extensibility aspects, is that when we are building on general standards and enabling the inclusion of new attributes from other schemas, that also means that we have to reference those other schemas with their namespaces, because Otherwise, we won't be able to essentially validate um, our files anymore. So that being said, usually these things are kind of operating in a very fixed set of other namespaces. So you won't kind of go haywall um, and kind of include anything and everything uh, that you can think of. But usually in the context of your description practices, you might have kind of two, three, maybe four related standards that you usually would be working with. So that kind of provides us with a, with a smaller focus on this. Um, if you're hand coding, it usually will be sufficient to declare those other namespaces once. So you don't have to do that every time if you use an element from those other standards. Uh, so you do that usually in the root element. And depending on the editor that you're using for hand coding, and to some extent we've already seen also depending on the version of the editor that you're using, um, you might or might not have to include the namespace abbreviation with each of the element and attributes. So in some versions, the more advanced and, and newer versions, it's essentially sufficient to have the namespace declared once um, in, in a wrapper element, for example, but then all the other elements following from that um, will automatically be assigned to that namespace. And of course, if you are mainly exporting or transforming data into ED or into ECCPF, um, those namespaces will usually be defined once in your export and transformation script. So again, it's not something that you have to think about in each and every case you're working with it. Going a little bit into the changes that ED 4.0 suggests in this context, um, and this is really just kind of a selection of a few things 
Um, I've linked the revision notes here that essentially kind of give you the full overview for anyone who's interested. Uh, I want to start with the aspect of reusing elements. Um, so what we've tried to do in the new version of EAD is to make sure that essentially when we are encoding specific types of information in different places of the EAD description, we are doing that by using the same set of elements and not kind of creating specific elements that are only available in one specific context. And I think the most obvious example is the element find a desk, which is a replacement of the file desk element that we have in ED3 and ED2002, um, where in ED4, we are essentially kind of reusing elements like title, agent, date, place, uh, which you can also find in other contexts of ED, while previous versions of ED use very specific elements like title proper, subtitle, author, publisher, they were only available. Similarly, we have um, the new element agent, uh, which brings together information about persons, organizations, and other groups of agents related to the material in one place, rather than having that kind of scattered in different sections of the EAD instance. Yeah. And similarly, we have the element place, uh, which kind of has a, a a similar level as agent, um, but also uh, now kind of allows you to encode grouped place information in different contexts in the same way. While ED2002 and ED3 um, had some places uh -huh. where you could encode the place name uh, and other places where you could only include address information, but you did not have the possibility to kind of include encode that information in one group. Um, and the last example that I wanted to mention is the element date. Um, and that is something that is more specific to ED3 than ED2002. Um, but we have decided to use one date element consistently in all contexts where we are talking about a single date being encoded, rather than having two elements like the date and the date single that ED3 introduced, essentially doing the same thing. The next aspect that falls into today's context is streamlining of content models. Um, and that kind of comes back to the aspect of maintaining the standards, but also the aspect of understanding the standards and knowing what to expect to a certain extent. Um, and basically, ED4 um, has four main content models. Um, so we have elements that come with a specific subset of sub-elements. Uh, one example for that is unit date structured, where you have the specific elements, date, date range, and date set to use with it. Then we have another group of elements that simply can contain text. Um, so nothing fancy, just kind of a text field. Um, and that is elements like address line, language, or date. We also still have elements that cater for formatting longer texts, and that is elements like scope content or process info. Uh, so essentially everything that currently sits next to the descriptive information uh, element. And then we have elements that allow for inline tagging or so-called mixed content. So they allow for text, but also allow for certain sub-elements. Um, and that's elements like abstract or unit title, or also the, the P tag. Um, and in the previous versions of EAD, um, these elements had kind of multiple variations of, of mixed content models. So you had some of these who had a, a basic content model uh, for mixed content. And then you had, I think three or even four different extensions to that. So from kind of something like, um, I think also unit ID is, is one of those who has kind of a, a relatively simple mixed content model in EAD3, um, two very complex elements like the P tag, where you had all the options that you can think about in terms of inline tagging. Um, there was a lot of variation in there. And in EAD4, we are kind of reducing that to just one mixed content model over all these contexts. 
speaking of the P tag, that brings me to the next aspect in this context, and that is formatting narrative texts. And that's probably one of the bigger changes that we have in ED4. Um, so that's elements like scope content, access conditions, related materials, but also the find a desk element that I mentioned earlier, um, and even description of components, uh, which includes a possibility to kind of have narrative texts in there. Um, and in ED4.0, um, these have a choice between breaking longer text down into simple paragraphs using the P tag, which is still part of the EES schemas, or using the new element formatting extension. And what formatting extension essentially does is that allows you the inclusion of any valid XHTML element for formatting. So that also includes paragraph, but it, it allows you to extend that to any types of lists uh, to include tables. It also allows you to have hierarchical headers or divisions of the text, which is something that EAD currently does not support. So with kind of including all of that from, from XHTML, we're essentially kind of opening up the formatting options that you have. Um, and we also have created a new format for the EAD schema, um, the NVDL format, which essentially allows you to have a combined validation of EAD and XHTML elements if you're making use of formatting extension in this way. Another point in the context of today's session is the use of attributes of other namespaces. Um, and this is something that we have now allowed for any element in EAD. Um, so in, in any element of EAD, you can now include attributes from other namespaces. Um, and that might be something simple like uh, keeping the full set of Xlink attributes. So if you're coming from EAD 2002, schema, you might be used to having Xlink attributes when you are creating links to digital objects or links to other external resources. Uh, so this will still be possible um, with this extension of having other namespaces included. But you might also want to uh, consider including attributes that are more specific and coming from any related standard that you're using together with ED. So that could be Mark 21, it could be METS, MODS, PREMISE, so anything that AD attributes might not be precise enough to encode. And then um, a last point uh, in terms of um, the extensibility, um, and this also kind of builds a little bit of bridge into what we will be talking about in the third session on the 9th of July, is uh, the encoding of related entities, such as agents, functions, places, or subjects, and their relationships with the archival material. Um, and here, it really kind of comes down to A, what you have, and B, what you want to do with the encoded information. Um, and it starts very simple by just naming the related entity. Um, and that is really the only aspect that is required in all the contexts uh, that I'm speaking of here. Uh, but it can then be extended um, as a first step, for example, by referring to more detailed descriptions of those related entities in external vocabularies. So by including a reference to the Library of Congress subject headings or the Virtual International Authority file or geonames, depending on what type of entity you are dealing with. And it can also be extended by providing more details about the entity and its relationship with the archival materials directly in EAD. So you now have a possibility to uh, more precisely encode the type of related entity or the role that the related entity has towards the materials. And you can also give temporal or geographic dimensions of the relationship. Um, as said, none of this is required, uh, but in certain contexts where you might want to support specific ways of, of displaying or navigating the data, um, those new features will be of big help, we think. And as a last point, um, before we go into the open mic part, uh, just some statistics in terms of the um, 
learning using manager and maintaining aspect that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so compared to AD3, the new version is down to 119 yeah. elements from previously 166. Um, and in this reduction, there's effectively only one element that we have removed completely. So without any alternative encoding, uh, while 69 elements have been replaced by or integrated with other elements. So there is a conversion or transformation route defined from AD3 to the new version. And similarly, uh, we have reduced the number of attributes from 85 to 66. Um, there are three attributes that we have currently suggested for removal. And again, 28 attributes have been replaced uh, with, by suggested alternative encodings. And with this, I'm just gonna stop and finalize uh, this, this presentation part of the meeting. And I think we might already have one question in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, yes, you do. So it, it was a question about, uh, you said date, and the question was, so it will be no more unit dates. So perhaps a couple of more words about that. Yes. Um, so we still have unit date. Uh, and we still currently also have the unit date structured option. Uh, so both options will still be available um, in the version of EAD4 as we have currently suggested it. Um, the, the date part that I was referring to earlier was specifically with regard to um, the, the unit date structured context, but also the um, mixed content context. So in ED3, um, when you are talking about unit date structured, uh, you have date single, date range, date set. Uh, while in other contexts for mixed content, for example, we had the date element as a possibility to encode a single date. And that is something that we wanted to, to level. Any we got a confirmation in the chat that that explained it. Thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, comments from anyone? So, so I, uh, thank you, Kirsten, for my ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this presentation. I have a question on formatting, use of formatting extension. Um, could it be a, a problem for an aggregator uh, if uh, its co content providers start using formatting extensions in different ways? Um, I mean, I think that's probably something that we um, still would need to kind of um, explore a little bit, but um, we wouldn't necessarily foresee that being an issue because essentially what formatting extension does it that it tells you that anything that follows in there is XHTML. Um, and that doesn't really kind of differ from whether you are using only kind of the the P tag with some some headers uh, from XHTML or if you are using lists and tables. So I think from an aggregator's perspective, as long as you kind of um, make sure that you support what HTML kind of supports, then you should be on the safe side. Okay, there'd be some sort of underlayer with bees. Yeah, so it's essentially kind of uh, the, the idea of, of that choice between uh, formatting extension and, and the P tag, um, as we have set it up in ED4 right now, is that if you know that you will only kind of have, I don't know, one paragraph, uh, which quite often is the case in, in a lot of those elements that, that we have that at the moment. Um, then the suggestion would be uh, to use the P tag that is part of ED, forget about formatting extension. 
Um, but for example, in, in contexts like scope content or also the biochist element, uh, where we know there's um, also a lot of kind of um, intellectual work uh, going mm. into these elements. Um, and there might be a possibility or the necessity even to structure those texts in a, a slightly different way. Um, and that's where formatting extension comes in and where you can kind of, yeah, do that in, in whatever way is, is the best fit for the data that you're encoding. Okay, thank you, because we, I don't know if it's the case in other countries, but in France, we had quite many question of, questions from colleagues who seemed very attached to all these formatting uh, elements, which are in EAD 2002. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this this definitely will be um, a, a learning curve, so to say. But I think um, a for all the elements that we currently have in EAD, there is a straightforward conversion into HTML expressions. Um, we also, at least that that's my experience from working with um, content providers and uh, their um, collection management system providers. Um, I know that often if you have a text field in, in a database uh, that allows you to kind of do paragraphs or line breaks or something like that, the kind of default export from that will be more XHTML than it is EAD. So I've seen a lot of export formats that have for example, the the A uh, element for a reference rather than having the XREF or REF element that we have in mm -hmm. EAD. So I think in, in those parts, it, it will be kind of um, a relatively straightforward transition, uh, even though it looks differently if you are looking at the XML files. Exactly. It will, the same elements will still be available. So let's put it this way. We have added way too many instead, mm -hmm. so you can do really nice things if you if you are really want to do formatting. So, using XHTML, you, we have extended the ways of possibilities to just not do only tables. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um. I had a, a question about um, in the um, in particular in the um, kind of editorial um, changes document, but um, also in some of the introductions, and then in sort of your slides, I think there's a lot more about uh, uh, relations and uh, and sort of def ways of defining them. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the relation, um, the REC standard, the um, and and what the sort of you know will that will this sort of be the way you were mentioning these other standards where it sort of just kind of points to and defines based on other standards or and also whether agents are ever being defined in relation to other agents or if the focus is really on defining agents to the archival records as you were mentioning. Yeah, so um, starting with, with RIC, uh, so Records and Context. Um, so Records and Context was one of those standards that we, uh, of course, followed the development and looked at as part of the major revision. Um, and as this is kind of uh, one of the, the bigger reference standards in the archival world, uh, we, of course, also wanted to make sure that we are laying the groundworks for EAD to be kind of more aligned with, with records and contexts. Uh, we are not kind of aiming at a complete alignment, um, as we also have the, the other two standards in, in our maintenance, so ESCCPF and, and the functions one that, that we will be publishing uh, soon also as a call for comments. Um, but essentially, and that is also something that the expert group on archival description has said um, with regard to the relationship that they see between RIG and the encoded archival standards, we would think that potentially in, in kind of a future combined version, so to say, of the encoded archival standards, they will together represent um, a different way of kind of working with the conceptual model of records and context, so kind of a parallel uh, option to work with it for the ontology that the records and context has published directly. 
Um, so that's the one thing. In terms of the the agents um, entity, I think that is something that you find in records and context, but you also find in in other um, kind of uh, contexts uh, when working with archival description. Uh, so there are a few kind of um, bigger um, collection management systems around that have kind of an agent module, so to say, uh, that allows you to describe records greater separately. Um, in the context of EAD, we are not kind of making those relationships between agents. Um, so we are essentially really looking at the relationship between an agent and the described materials. And if you wanted to kind of go into more details how a specific agent is, I don't know, part of a family, uh, and this is the brother and this is the parent and uh, things like this, um, then our suggestion is to do that in ESCCPF because that allows you to do all these kind of more specific agent to agent relations. Thank you, that's super helpful. I'm working on a bunch of snack projects and indigenous materials and we've been in the weeds on Rick and stuff. So I was just curious what the more specifics of the relationship were. So that's very helpful, thank you. And thank you for um, having these sessions at different hours uh, so <laughs> some of us could get here. Yeah, sure, well, you're welcome. Any other questions, comments from anyone? If that is not the case for now, maybe we can kind of bring up a few of the questions that we had for you. I'm just kind of check if there's one thing maybe. Um, yeah, Brigitte, if, if you have something um, in, in this regard, that would be great uh, if you could share that with us. Um, so kind of some statistics in terms of inline tagging. Um, yep. That's always helpful to have those kind of real life examples. I'll show you if, if I can share the, the screen? Yes. Um, can you just try if that is possible for you right now? Yes. I I have it. Uh, yep. By, uh, okay. Uh, you need to stop sharing first, Kirsty. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, no, but the, I, where, where, where I have uh yeah um uh okay yeah it's coming up yeah so uh, uh, uh the rule is um all the same for all libraries in france but the um, the statistics is only for universities library uh and um in the whole database we have uh, this, uh, how many first name we have, how many court name, how many, and so on. And um, this percentage in control access and this in entire library. So okay. uh, it depends really on the, um, uh, on the indexation element. Mm. Uh, and we, we can see uh, in tag libraries is first name, uh, title, uh, genre form, uh, in French, we have specific uh, specific uh, list uh, of the form, uh, and it's um, on the whole database. Uh, mm -hmm. If we see only um, the um, the um, 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 so composant uh, create and not uh, uh, and not um, 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 we create directly. Uh, it's uh, it's bigger uh, here, but uh, what? And where is uh, in tag uh, inline tagging? Uh, uh, it is in um, this uh, title unit title, uh, this cop content, uh, desk and fizz um, uh, fizz facet for uh, Jean Fon. Uh, only this facet. Uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. I can uh, send this uh, uh, and yeah, how many uh, C uh, is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting to, to have that. I'm just going to put my email address into the chat. So if okay. you want to share that with me, that, that would be great. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, and also just picking up on Louise's uh, comment in the chat, uh, we'll make sure that, that one of our uh, next examples uh, will include um, a, a tagging similar to, to DAO group with, with the new options uh, and the new element. Uh, good point. Um, yeah, bringing back up my slides just to kind of go back to the questions that we had for you. Um, just to see if we can get through some of those. Um, I don't know if we need to. Okay. So, um, Starting with those those elements and attributes that we have effectively removed in the new version of EAD uh, without um, a specific um, substitution, so to say. Uh, and this is one that is very specific to EAD3 users. So I don't know if we have any EAD3 users um, in the house at the moment, but if you use EAD3, um, we would be interested in whether you use local control, and if you do um, to get an understanding of what type of information you encode in local control at the moment. So I don't know if that is something that applies to, to anyone here. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. I think you can move to the next one. <laughs> yeah, I think we probably can move can move to the next one. Um, the next one is is one that is also very specific in in its use, but it is applicable to EAD two thousand two as well. Um, so that's the the attributes entity ref respectively X pointer, which is kind of an alternative uh, for encoding references uh, to the just simple and generic href attribute that we have. Um, so if you have kind of an entity declaration approach, or if you want to kind of specifically point to the part, uh, a certain part of an external resource, you might be using one of these attributes, but um, yeah, just interested if, if anyone is using them. Uh, we got uh, one more uh, one response in the chat to the previous one, uh, where the local control is not used in that setting either. But instead, you could be it's easier to use control and attribute local type. Yeah, and I'm assuming as no one is jumping on the question that we currently see on the screen, that is also not applicable for anyone in the group today. Um, so maybe going to, to this one, which might be a little bit more uh, in, in your ball pit. Um, so just interested in the formatting options that you currently use or support in your context. So is this mainly simple paragraphs? Are you using lists, tables? Would you want to use hierarchical headers, um, footnotes, things like this? Um, or are there any other formatting um, elements that you would want to see supported? I don't know if anyone wants, wants to take this. In French library, we, we use um, simple paragraph. Um, Hierarchical header in bibliography. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, block note only for uh, poem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But no, uh, uh, no table. No tables. That's that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> In the German archives portal, we have paragraphs and, and headings. Um, and we try to get rid of all other uh, formats because uh, format will be done by the portal front end. There is one exception that is lists. And that is because uh, of uh, because we still use EAD 2002. And I Hope uh, we uh, so we don't use lists in the in the sense that it should be used, but we misuse it, and I think that we uh, will also get rid of lists and uh, in the future uh, use uh, the proper elements that are uh, provided by EAD for. So we use it for uh, more uh, information on what is essentially agents in EAD for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Niels. And on the French uh, archives portal, we, we use uh, simple paragraphs, uh, headers, and I've seen also lists, which pose some uh, problems for uh, because they are misused for uh, yeah. Um, Numerical the uh, numerical accessibility for disabled. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure. I don't think the tables or footnotes, block quotes, we try to exclude all of these. Hmm. No. Okay. Thank you very much for for that. Um, as a follow up question, um, we would just be interested in getting an understanding of whether there are specific elements where you think, for example, the lists or the kind of different headers that you mentioned earlier um, appear more often than than in others. Um, and um, yeah. I don't know if if there are any examples that you that you can think of, or if you're just saying okay, any element that generally supports this in EAD also kind of supports it in in your use context. Right. Difficult to reply. <laughs> Like this on the spot. Uh, I've seen it in uh, Biogist mainly, mm -hmm. but I could dig a little bit and make a follow up next week. Yeah, if if you if you have the time to do that, that would be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think it would just be interesting to to understand if if there are preferences, so to say, in terms of uh, elements where this is. This is used more than than in others. Um, I think from the examples that I've seen, um, I would have su suspected that it might happen more in Biokist, as you mentioned, Mano Money, and uh, maybe in Scope Content. But um, yes. others, I haven't necessarily seen that elaborate in terms of the formatting. Yeah, sometimes in uh, bibliography also, mm -hmm. you can uh, have it. Yeah. This is the case uh, also on the German archives portals, also uh, for scope content and abstract um, and uh, other descriptive info in EAD4, so uh, the uh, ODD element. Okay, yeah. And just, just as a follow-up question, um, is, is this really kind of any other descriptive info or are you using that for kind of specific types of information in your context, Niels? Uh, this is any other kind of other descriptive uh, okay. info that uh, the archives, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
slightly related to to this and and kind of picking up on on the aspect of um allowing uh, attributes from from other namespaces um just just the question of whether your collections or the collections of the institutions that you work with uh, include any specific types of material that might require specific encoding options so i'm thinking things like audiovisual material or i don't know coin collections um or kind of things that that are a little bit out of the usual but still might be part of archival descriptions and might have kind of a, a slightly different set of encoding requirements, so to say. Um, At the National Archives of France, there's a, there are colleagues who are have of the audiovisual uh, section uh, having a lo close look to E84 mm -hmm. on these aspects. Okay. So they, you'll get some feedback, but in July only. Okay, that's that's good to to have that. And they were also having a look uh, for uh, born digital documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. In uh, two in in libraries, uh, uh, in France, uh, in France, um, we have um, uh, audio material. Uh, interview and so on, and uh, objects and uh, digital uh, digital uh, native, um, some uh, some in print uh, and um, da, 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 uh, and um, uh, uh, and so on. Okay. And at the moment, um, are you describing those materials just in, in EAD with, with what it offers, or are you kind of describing those materials in, in other standards and then, I don't know, reference that, those descriptions from EAD? In EAD, but we have specific lists uh, mm -hmm. uh, for this facet, for uh, uh, genre form, for, uh, uh, and we have a uh, limit in added two, uh, and <laughs> it's complicated to to add the right uh, the right description. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thanks very much for for this. There is, I think, one more comment. From Louis in the chat uh, about born digital archives and the um, standard SEDA uh, in France, uh, SEDA. Um, but he also said that this is mainly uh, aiming at transferring between different IT systems. Um, so the descriptive part is minimal uh, and partially aligned with EAD. Um, so thanks very much for that addition, Louis. Um, and then just uh, one last question, also in the interest of time as we are coming up to the hour. Um, just out of interest uh, and picking up on the extensibility uh, op uh, aspect of today's session. Um, so we've currently got kind of two main elements, uh, essentially, that allow you um, to encode information either as a general text field or in a more structured way. So that's the unit date and the extent and other physical information. Um, and we were just wondering if if you, from your context, see a preference in terms of the one or the other direction. So do you find more uh, generic text fields or do you find more st structured elements or is that kind of a balance? Um, and are there any other types of information that you encode in a more structured way? I think I have a lot of food. No, I'll just note the question and reach back a little <laughs> later. Uh, in libraries, we have a lot of uh, facet, very precise. 
um, but I can't, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm put uh, the link in, in chat, but today the seat is uh, out. But um, we have very precise FISFA set uh, for um, rule, uh, type, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you if you want to share that link later on via email, Bridget, uh, please feel okay. free to do so. It's better. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, and I think this brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, thanks very much again, everyone, for uh, your participation. Um, here's just kind of the reminder that uh, we will be looking forward to your comments also uh, via the usual way, so on GitHub or our web form, uh, respectively. If there's any general questions or comments, you can also reach out to us via our email. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's one of these open sessions remaining at the moment on the 9th of July that will be uh, more focused to the Americas um, communities. Um, uh, so that will be 4 p.m. universal time. Um, and um, yeah, maybe I'll see some of you uh, in that session as well. Thank you very much. And I wish you a good rest of your days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.